The Tragic Tale of Vitus Gerulaitis Vitus Gerulaitis was an extravagant figure in professional tennis. Endowed with great natural talent, long blonde hair, and a deep love of rock and roll, his time at the top of the game was as impressive as it was short-lived. Many misfortunes befell the life of this late tennis icon. His on-court achievements were nothing short of spectacular. But why was his life so tragic and how did he die? We will learn about all this and more, so stay tuned to Forehand Frenzy for the full story. Vitas was born on June 26, 1954, in Brooklyn, New York. He was the son of Lithuanian immigrants who left their homeland in 1939 before the Russian invasion to seek a life of opportunity in the United States. He lived with his parents then for most of his career, and his love for the sport seemingly was inherited from his father, who was a pre plus World War II tennis champion. He spent his childhood in Howard Beach, Queens. His first title as a professional was achieved in Vienna when he was only 20 years old, and in commemoration of his achievements at the historic venue, there are 25 individual titles and eight doubles titles, including Wimbledon with his compatriot Sandy Mayer. The son of Lithuanian immigrants, he was considered one of the least exploited talents in the history of tennis. He is remembered as one of the most pleasant players to watch, for the show he gave with his very fast movement of hands on the net and his ability to cover the court with incredible speed. He always went on the attack. His last grand final was played at the 1981 Masters, where he lost again, but this time against the Czech Ivan Lendl. And his last tournament win was in Treviso in 1984. He retired two years later at the age of 31 and became a television commentator with John McEnroe and Mary Carrillo, with whom he trained in his youth. Vitus Gerolaitis won the Australian Open in 1977, beating John Lloyd, and was runner-up at two other U.S. Open Grand Slams in 1979 and Roland Garros in 1980. But his career was overshadowed by legendary tennis players such as Jimmy Connors, Bjorn Borg, and his great friend John McEnroe. As a result, today many people are unaware of Vitus Gerolaitis' contributions to the sport of tennis, in spite of their impressive and wide-ranging nature. He came to occupy the number three position in the ATP rankings in 1979, and for more than six years between 1977 and 1983, he was among the ten best tennis players in the world. He is one of the great legends of tennis history, and fellow players, fans, and relatives spoke highly of his chivalry both on and off the playing courts. The world of tennis was experiencing another seemingly uneventful day, when on the morning of Sunday, September 17, 1994, every news outlet simultaneously announced Vidas Gerolaitis' tragic death from inhaling carbon monoxide. This took place during his sleep, in an apparent domestic accident at the home of his friend Martin Reyes. Vidas was 40 years of age. A house cleaner who attended every day to tidy found the corpse of the player dressed and lying on the bed. That same afternoon, Vidas was due to attend a charity party hosted by former world number no. 4 ranked tennis player Nancy Chaffee Whitaker at the East Hampton Racquet Club. It has not yet been possible to determine whether the 1977 Australian Open champion was awake or asleep at the time of the accident. Nancy Whitaker assured that she had seen Gerolaitis the day before and that she had found him very well. She was even very excited about the event, she said. He seemed to be perfectly fine. There was nothing to suggest that something was wrong with him or that he was unwell, she pointed out. He patted me on the arm and said, I'll see you at 7 when dinner at the club was scheduled. The nature of carbon monoxide poisoning is such that its onset is silent, insidious, and all too often rapid. It is reversible by inhaling oxygen deeply. However, typically, victims are located in areas of suboptimal ventilation and are not always accessed in time. As mentioned earlier, Gerolaitis was staying at the time at the home of his friend Martin Reigns, a former tennis player who he used to visit often at his Southampton home. Vitus had played his last game on Wednesday night in Seattle. It was a tournament of the Circuit of Champions reserved for players over 35 years of age. In that match, he teamed up with Jimmy Connors against Bjorn Borg and John Lloyd, and the American duo lost in two sets although they turned in an extraordinarily impressive performance on the court. Vitus later decided to withdraw from the competition due to back problems. However, the match amused everyone present. 
from the audience to the players themselves, including the chair umpire, who, when he warned the contestants by shouting new balls, received Gerolatus's witty repartee, new balls, players old. His funeral ceremony was very emotional and poignant. His close family members received innumerable expressions of condolences for the death of Gerolaitis. Many tennis professionals offered emotional tributes to the player, and in various matches, whether hard courts, grass, or clay, the minute of silence was observed for several weeks after his death as a mark of respect. Victor Pecci, a former tennis player considered the best Paraguayan tennis player in history and ranked ninth in the world in 1980, said he was shocked by the death of Vitas Gerolaitis, whom he described as the example of regularity among the tennis players of his generation. While Gerolaitis did not have a dedicated training schedule at the time of his passing, he faced everything very seriously and remained high up in the rankings because he was very rigorous in his performance, he declared. He made his movements mechanical to a very high degree of perfection, almost automating his service action, in addition to having prodigious and fast legs, and these attributes made him capable of reaching even difficult balls, he commented. Pecci also said that Gerolaitis was a great friend with whom he shared pleasant moments when they struggled to progress through the rounds of various international competitions. Although he was a little older than me, he accompanied Jimmy Connors, Bjorn Borg, Guillermo Vilas, and others on the international circuit, added the top Paraguayan tennis figure. Without a doubt, we are talking about a player who trained with, learned from, and improved alongside a generation of athletes whom he positively influenced, including the great Guillermo Vilas. All his life, he sought limits to his reality. He did it with tennis, with his private life, and with everything he undertook. He was the first to open the doors to a world closely linked to tennis. Music, he said of his colleague following his tragic death. Against Gerolaitis, Vilas played a memorable match at the Italian Open final in 1979. It was May 2nd in Rome. Vitas prevailed in five sets after a titanic tussle that lasted for four hours and 53 minutes. It was the longest final in the history of that tournament, and it took more than 25 years for the duration of a clay court final to break that record. It was also Jerry Lytus who influenced his attempts to make a living from monetizing his talents through endorsements and tournament winnings. Guillermo read that Jerry Lytus had won a tournament with a prize of $5,000. If they pay players so much, why not me, if I always win them? That's when he decided that he was going to become a professional. He further added, it was Vitus Gerolaitis who taught me that he who loses the shelter of his family loses the closest bond with pure feeling. Vitus Gerolaitis was quite a showman both on and off the field of play. With rivals of the caliber of Bjorn Borg, Jimmy Connors, and John McEnroe, it would be easy to conclude that such characters would be any player's worst nightmare. But nothing could overshadow Vitus's powerful self-belief. Vitus's win-loss record against the three aforementioned tennis players was decidedly underwhelming. Against Borg, there were 17 losses and no wins. Facing McEnroe, he earned five wins but was beaten 11 times, while with Connors, he played 19 matches and only won five. When the latter had a record of 16 consecutive victories against Gerolaitis, it seemed as though Connors was invincible while playing Vitus. However, this was not true. Vitus was able finally to finally defeat him. This took place during the 1979 Master Cup in New York, where with a score of 7, 5 and 6, 2, he managed to undo this curse. In the post-match press conference, he boasted of his historic victory, declaring, and let that serve as a lesson to all of you that no one can beat Vitas Gerolaitis 17 times in a row. The assembled journalists erupted immediately into fits of laughter. In 1985, he was embroiled in controversy when he declared that 95% of female tennis players could not play, and that the number one player in women's tennis would easily lose to the number one in the men's ranking. This type of joke was common at the time, and there is a lot of truth to the fact that the men's and women's games are quite different. But anyway, the number one at that time in both singles and doubles was Martina Navratilova. On the back of Vitas's comments, a men's versus women's challenge was arranged to play doubles. Martina teamed up with Pam Shriver, both of whom were the number one players on the doubles circuit. For his part, Vitus played in a pair with a 67-year-old veteran, Bobby Riggs. 
Clearly, choosing such an old partner was a joke to bring some humor to the occasion, but tactically it was perhaps a less than astute move. The duo lost to Navratilova and Shriver in straight sets and were humiliated by the press as though this had been a serious match. Vitas finally retired from professional competition the following year, after feeling that he had fulfilled his career satisfactorily and that he could not expect after many years to return to the top 10 of the ATP rankings. Almost 30 years have passed since his death, and there are those who still remember him within the field of tennis for being a role model. They emphasize that he was a player who played practically flat, made no effort, and had impressive leg movement. His driving technique with his hard arm, which did not let go of the wrist too much, pushed the ball in a deft manner with highly accurate placement. In addition to playing very good drop shots, Vitus also had a great volley. Whenever we talk about great athletes, it usually happens that the closing chapter of the player's life is somehow less stellar than earlier days, or that it is marked by disgrace or wasted potential, leaving adoring fans all the more helpless and with a void in their hearts where joy and happiness should reside. While Vitus's life was cut short by an unexpected and tragic incident, this did not detract from or diminish in any way the extent and scope and example of his on-court achievements. Although we mourn his death, we can value what he did in life and admire his great achievements, winning humor and positive example for the next generation. This was the tragic story of Vitas Gerulaitis, perhaps one of the most underrated tennis players in history. Do you like our content? Do not stop here. By subscribing to our YouTube channel, you can access all the latest and greatest news in the world of tennis. Have a look around our channel and watch some of the amazing videos on offer. There's something for everyone, so get browsing and feel free to like your favorite video and subscribe immediately. See you in the next video.